What if I told you that the number one risk factor for dying worldwide is a bad diet, killing about 11 million people every year? What we eat is probably the most important factor for our health and well-being and longevity, and yet, in the internet age, it can be really challenging to find out what is true and what is just nonsense. How do you make sense of this ocean of noise? So in this video series, we're going to approach the topic of nutrition from an integral perspective, really looking at the best insights from modern science and our ancient wisdom traditions, and really focusing on those principles that are most important to apply in your own life, without getting lost in the details. In today's video, we're going to explore what the total balance of the scientific evidence suggests is a healthy diet, and why it's so easy to be misled if you're only looking at part of the data. Hey everyone, Timo here. Welcome back to Integral Wellbeing. So let me start by just telling you a little story. When I was a teenager, I was basically a nutrition nerd. From the age of about 16, I started reading nutrition studies in my free time because I was just totally fascinated with the question. It seemed to me that what we eat is such an important part of our health and our longevity and our well-being. And yet in school, there was basically nothing I learned that was actually useful. Even more concerning to me was the fact that doctors, physicians, basically get almost no training in nutrition whatsoever. And in most medical schools, it's about four hours in their entire medical career. So as a teenager, I started looking at nutrition studies and nutrition experts online to try to find out what actually is healthy. So very often at night at the dinner table, I would be there quoting some new study to my parents about how this is bad or this is healthy. And they would be like, oh, I have to change my diet again. So as I was learning more, I started adopting different diets. Basically, you grew up vegetarian, eating eggs and fish, and then gradually started incorporating more meat because I thought I needed the protein for weightlifting. Gradually, I became interested in low carb, and then I did ketogenic, and then I did vegan. I've done almost everything. What I started realizing as time went on was that the diet wars that you see so prominently on YouTube and the internet in general are mostly driven by people looking only at part of the data. You see people basically looking at studies that confirm what they want to believe and ignoring the ones that don't confirm that. So at one point I learned a very useful concept that would help me sort of sift through all this noise called the hierarchy of evidence. Basically the idea is that in scientific research not all studies are equal. A lot of studies that people base themselves on when they make claims about nutrition are basically observational studies or epidemiological studies where it's very difficult to tease apart what is cause and effect and what is just correlation. A lot of times if you really want to prove cause and effect you want to do a randomized controlled trial or an RCT. But even looking at individual RCTs can be extremely confusing. A lot of them have contradictory results. So how are you as a layperson supposed to find out what is healthy nutrition just by reading the scientific literature? It's very difficult. So luckily we have these very interesting studies called meta-analyses and systematic reviews. These studies basically take the results of dozens or hundreds of other studies and summarize them so you can find out what the balance of evidence currently suggests about a particular issue. And so I started finding the scientific experts who are really trying to look at the big picture. People like Dr. Mike Isretel, Dr. Peter Atia, Dr. Michael Greger, and so on. So for example, Mike Isretel is a professor of exercise science and sports physiology who teaches courses in nutrition at university level. Dr. Mike Isretel and his team wrote this book called Understanding Healthy Eating where the researchers behind this book tried to look at every single systematic review about the relationship between health and nutrition. And then they tried to compare how much different principles of nutrition compare to each other in terms of their importance. And guess what they found? The number one principle that matters the most for your health is calorie balance. They concluded that calorie balance accounts for about 60% of the total health effect of your diet. So the number one principle was calorie balance, 60%. The next most important principle was food composition, or where you actually get your food from and whether those food sources are healthy or not, accounting for about 20% of the total health effect. Next was macronutrient amounts, about 10%. And then nutrient timing, 5%. 
hydration only 2.5%, and finally supplements with only 2.5% also. Now, this is a really surprising finding because for a lot of people they would assume, isn't it most important that you get most of your food from healthy sources? But they actually argue that even when you eat mostly healthy foods, if you eat far too much of them, you can still be very unhealthy. The reason seems to be that when you overconsume calories, you really consume much more energy than your body burns every day, you accumulate body fat, which actually has very disastrous effects on your metabolic health. Not only your metabolic health, but also your blood pressure, your blood lipids, and chronic inflammation. Now, of course, if you get most of your calories from really healthy sources, you will also probably not consume too many calories because most of these foods are very satiating. So when they're talking about food composition, they're really arguing that we should be getting most of our food from sources that are very high in micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, fiber, things like that. That we should be getting our proteins mostly from complete or complementary sources such as leaner animal products or things like quinoa and soy if you're more plant-based. It would also be best if we got most of our carbohydrates from whole grains, fruits and vegetables and obviously limiting refined sugars and refined carbohydrates like flour products. And then if we can get our fats mostly from mono and polyunsaturated sources, in other words nuts and seeds, olive oil, avocado, things like that, on balance, we're going to be healthier. And you especially need to look out for trans fats, which are mostly found in processed junk and hydrogenated oils. What's very interesting in the nutrition world is that there's a lot of controversy about whether saturated fat is unhealthy or not. But what's interesting is that there's basically no one arguing that saturated fat is on balance beneficial for your health. It's basically either neutral or detrimental. And so as the researchers who wrote this book argue, replacing any fat source with a monounsaturated fat source seems to improve health outcomes. So if you try to aim for getting most of your fats from mono and polyunsaturated sources, you're probably going to be good to go. The reason they argue that macronutrients are not as important as people think and only account for about 10% of total health is because it's actually relatively easy to get your bare minimum amount from just regular eating. True protein deficiency is very rare in countries where there's any level of economic development. There's no minimal intake of carbohydrate really. The human body can manufacture it on its own. And the bare minimum amount of fat that we need just to get the essential fatty acids, the omega-3s and omega-6s, is really quite low. And so they demonstrate that there are diets that are high in carbs, low in carbs, high in fat, low in fat, that can all be quite healthy. Of course, taking into consideration what we said before, that you're not just eating, you know, buckets full of butter. Nutrient timing also doesn't seem to be nearly as important as people think. Many, many kind of meal spacings have been studied, and for the most part, it's barely detectable that it has any effect on our total health. A lot of the hype about intermittent fasting seems to overlook the fact that in almost all of the studies where intermittent fasting shows any benefits, it's actually the caloric restriction that is doing the trick. The reason these researchers argue that hydration is barely important is because they argue it mostly takes care of itself. You know, the body has a very well conserved thirst mechanism and so the moment we get thirsty we drink and that's sufficient to keep us healthy. I think there's more to be said about that, but that's the subject of a later video in the series. And finally, supplements only seem to account for about 2.5% of total health. The reality is that most supplements, when you study them really well, just don't do anything. If you want to find out which supplements actually do have any proven health benefits, I would recommend checking out examine.com, where they summarize all the research studies about supplements in one place. Now this is all very interesting, but what if your focus is not just health, the avoidance of disease, but actually more broadly, longevity? You know, I want to live as long as possible, not just be free of disease while I'm alive. When you look at the work of Peter Atia, MD, who is a physician who specializes in longevity research, he basically argues that the most important thing we can do with our diet for our longevity is definitely also calorie balance. He argues that the next most important thing after calories is getting enough protein. The reason for that is because according to his research, strength and muscle mass are some of the most highly correlated with longevity. 
And then as almost as a side note, he sort of says, well, you should also get all of your micronutrients. The thing is that this advice leaves us with so many options. There's so many ways of putting together a diet that doesn't have too many calories, kind of has healthy sources, but very broadly, and gets enough protein. Does it really not matter that much where those calories and protein come from? And so this is where I think Dr. Michael Greger's work is really illuminating. Dr. Michael Greger is a physician who specializes in clinical nutrition and is also the co-founder of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Dr. Greger and his team read every single scientific nutrition study that comes out in every English language scientific journal every year since 2007. And they even go back in the stacks to compare it to older research. His latest book, How Not to Age, had literally 13,000 citations. So what's remarkable is that there's basically no one like him out there. There's no one who comprehensively reads every single study on the topic of nutrition every year. So if anyone has a balanced overview of the total evidence, it is him. So what is the study that he likes to quote the most when it comes to nutrition? It's the Global Burden of Disease Study. The Global Burden of Disease Study is the most systematic analysis ever done of causes of death for human beings in history. And according to that study, our diet is the number one risk factor for death in the United States and the rest of the world. So, what did they find? They say, and I quote, Our findings show that suboptimal diet is responsible for more deaths than any other risks globally, including tobacco smoking. Now, tobacco smoking is often called the leading cause of death in the world by the World Health Organization at about 8 million deaths a year. But as I said in the introduction, our diet kills about 11 million people a year. And so what did they argue are the main things that are wrong with our diet? They go on to say the leading dietary risk factors for mortality are diets high in sodium, low in whole grains, low in fruit, low in nuts and seeds, low in vegetables, and low in omega-3 fatty acids. Each of these accounting for more than 2% of global deaths. And so they argue that improvement in diet could literally prevent one in every five deaths globally. Now, slightly surprising, the first thing they mention is diets high in sodium, in other words, salt. Now, what's interesting is that both Peter Atiyah's book and Mike Isertel's book don't mention salt at all as an issue. Now, before we get into why salt is the silent killer in our diet, let's first look at what we're not getting enough of. So we're not getting enough whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, and omega-3 fatty acids, which would suggest a more plant-based style of eating would be best, according to the largest study ever done on the topic. So do we have any good evidence on which food groups are definitely better to avoid? One of Dr. Greger's favorite studies is a review of reviews. In other words, a complete review of all meta-analyses and systematic reviews ever published on the relationship between certain food groups and diet-related chronic diseases. They literally looked at all studies between 1950 and 2014. And so to summarize their findings, what they found is that the vast majority, 94% of reviews on whole plant foods, show either protective or at the very least neutral effects, whereas most, 77%, reviews of animal-based foods identify deleterious health effects or at best neutral ones. So as you can see looking at this chart, it's very obvious that the plant-based foods on the whole are either protective or neutral. Fruits, mostly beneficial. Vegetables, mostly beneficial. Whole grains, same thing. The only outliers seem to be legumes and nuts and seeds. Now, the reason for that, if you actually read the whole study, is that some fermented soy foods have been associated with some increased risk of cancers of the digestive tract. But when you look at the definition of fermented soy foods, these are mostly highly processed sauces that are very high in salt. Whole soy products are actually some of the healthiest foods in the study. And the reason that nuts and seeds are sometimes not so beneficial is mainly because they can lead to weight gain. So you obviously can't just eat bags full every day and expect to be healthy. But if you consume moderate amounts, they are incredibly beneficial for your health. So what about these animal foods? If it wasn't for dairy and fish, almost 
all of the systematic reviews and meta-analyses on animal foods show that they're harmful or at best neutral. Not a single review found that eggs and poultry are ever beneficial for health. They're either neutral or harmful. And this is despite all of the funding coming from the poultry and egg industry on these kind of studies. The main reason that so many systematic reviews find beneficial effects from fish seems to be because of the omega-3 fatty acids. However, what most people don't realize is that actually all of the omega-3s found in fish actually come from algae. Fish actually eat algae and then concentrate these fatty acids in their tissue. But the problem is that fish is also currently the main source of industrial pollutants in our diet. So if you want to get the health benefits of fish without getting all the pollutants, you can just as easily take an algae oil supplement. If you do the math, it's even cheaper than eating fish. When you look at the dairy category, you can see that a lot of these studies show dairy can be beneficial. However, Dr. Greger argues that most of the studies on dairy either suffer from substitution effects, where people eating dairy are usually replacing something that was even worse for them, and that dairy studies are notoriously influenced by the dairy industry. Most of the protective effects against cancers seem to come from the calcium, argues Greger. And so you can actually get all the calcium you want from healthier plant food sources, such as beans, greens, and plant-based milks like soy milk. So summarizing the study, Gregor says, nine out of 10 study reviews show that whole plant foods are in the very least not bad, whereas about eight out of 10 of the reviews on animal products show them to not be good. So if you actually look at food groups specifically, it really does seem like eating more whole plant foods and less animal foods is really important for our health. Now, finally, the salt issue. The reason that salt and sodium is humanity's number one dietary risk factor of death is because it raises blood pressure. And high blood pressure increases your risk of almost all chronic diseases. We're gonna do a deep dive on sodium in a later video, but for now, what should you do about it? As a recommended upper limit, Dr. Greger recommends getting at most 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Now, almost no one today eats that little salt. One of the main reasons it seems to be so difficult to eat less salt is because our taste receptors take about two to four weeks to actually adjust to the different taste. After about two to four weeks, the salt receptors on your tongue actually are proven to become more sensitive to salt, thereby your food tasting actually better. Another way to cut salt intake is to try potassium chloride or potassium salt. This is a naturally occurring mineral salt that we can obtain pretty much the same way we get sodium salt. And yet in randomized control trials, when you give people potassium salt, their blood pressure really improves and there's far less death. So in conclusion, we can say that the balance of evidence clearly does suggest that a diet centered around whole plant foods gives us the best health outcomes. It's naturally low in calories, refined sugars, salt, saturated fat, and trans fats, and that it's really best to avoid red meat, processed meat, poultry, and eggs. If you really want to get some animal products in your diet, the best choice would actually be the lower fat dairy and fish. As Dr. Greger argues in his first book, How Not to Die, the dividing line between health promoting and disease promoting foods may be less plant versus animal sourced foods and more whole plant foods versus almost everything else. Now, if you want to keep yourself kind of accountable to eat more whole plant foods and improve your diet, I recommend checking out this free app called The Daily Dozen, where you can actually keep track of how many of these really healthy foods you're eating every day to keep yourself on track. If you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. I'm currently also in the process of creating online courses where you can learn how to implement many of these principles in your own life using evidence-based behavior change strategies. So if you would like to be notified when these courses come out, please leave your email in the description below. So stay tuned for the next video, where we're going to be looking at the most important habits for having a healthy night of sleep.